Part three, chapter two of Mushrooms on the Moor. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Mushrooms on the Moor by Frank W. Borum. Part three, chapter two. Mushrooms on the Moor. Mr. G. K. Chesterton does not like mushrooms. That is the most arresting fact that I have gleaned from reading, carefully and with delight, his Victorian age in literature. In his treatment of Dickens, he writes very contemptuously of that little Bethel to which Kit's mother went, and he likens it to a monstrous mushroom that grows in the moonshine and dies in the dawn. Now, no man who was really fond of the esculent and homely fungus would have employed such a metaphor by way of disparagement. I can only infer that Mr. Chesterton thinks mushrooms very nasty. His opinion of Little Bethel does not concern me. It is neither here nor there. But Mr. Chesterton does not like mushrooms. I cannot get over that. I feel very sorry for Mr. Chesterton. It is not merely a matter of taste. I would not presume to set my opinion in a matter of this kind over his. But the authorities are with me. I have looked up the Encyclopedia Britannica, and its opening sentence on the subject affirms that there are few more delicious members of the vegetable kingdom than the common mushroom. I suppose that in these matters association has a lot to do with it. I cannot forget those delicious summer mornings in England when we boys, rising with the lark, stole out of the house like so many burglars, and scampered with our baskets across the fragrant meadows to gather the white buttons that dotted the sparkling dew-drenched grass. It was, as I have said in the introduction to this book, a large part of childhood's radiant romance. What tales our fancy wove into the fairy rings under the elm trees. We lifted each moist fungus, half expecting to see the brownies and elves fly from beneath it. And what fearsome care we took to include no single hypocritical toadstool among our treasures. I am really afraid that Mr. Chesterton would have been less conscientious. Mushrooms and toadstools are all alike to him. He can never have had such frolics in the fields as we enjoyed in those ecstatic summer mornings, and he never, therefore, knew the fierce joy of the breakfast that followed when, hungry as hunters, we returned with flushed faces to feast upon the spoils of our boisterous foray. Over such brave memories Mr. Chesterton cannot fondly linger, for Mr. Chesterton does not like mushrooms. What would the harvester have said to Mr. Chesterton? For to Jean Stratton Porter's hero, mushrooms were halfway to destiny. In the morning, brilliant sunshine awoke him, and he arose to find the earth steaming. If ever there was a perfect mushroom morning, he said to his dog, we must hurry and feed the stock and ourselves and gather some. The harvester breakfasted, fed the stock, hitched Betsy to the spring wagon, and went into the dripping, steamy woods. If anyone had asked him that morning concerning his idea of heaven, he would never have dreamed of describing gold-paved streets, crystal pillars, jewelled gates and thrones of ivory. He would have told you that the woods on a damp, sunny May morning was heaven. He only opened his soul to beauty, and steadily climbed the hill to the crest, and then down the other side to the rich, half-shaded, half-open spaces where big, rough mushrooms sprang in a night. Yes, a mushroom morning was heaven to the harvester and it was the mushrooms that led him the first step of the way towards the discovery of his dream-girl the mushrooms represented the first of those golden stairs by which he climbed to his paradise and mr chesterton does not like mushrooms what would the harvester have said to mr chesterton one faint struggling glimmer of hope i am delighted to discover mr chesterton likens little bethel to a monstrous mushroom there can be only one reason for this inartistic mixture of analogy and antithesis. Mr. Chesterton evidently knows that a large mushroom is not so sweet or so toothsome as a small one. A monstrous mushroom, even to those who like mushrooms, is coarse and less tasty. Now, the gleam of hope lies in the circumstance that Mr. Chesterton knows the fine gradations of niceness or nastiness that distinguish mushrooms of one size from mushrooms of another as a rule if you get to know a thing you get to like it mr chesterton is coming to know mushrooms he will soon be ordering them for breakfast he may even come like certain tribes mentioned in the encyclopedia to eat nothing else and by that time he may have come to know little bethel 
and if he comes to know it, he may come to like it. He will still liken it to a mushroom, but we shall be able to tell by the way he says it that he means it is very good. And we shall see at once that Mr. Chesterton likes mushrooms. At present, however, the stern fact remains, Mr. Chesterton does not like mushrooms. Richard Jeffreys, at his amateur poacher, says that mushrooms are good either raw or cooked. The great naturalist is therefore altogether on the side of the encyclopedia. Some eat mushrooms raw, fresh as taken from the ground, with a little salt, but to me the taste is then too strong. Perhaps that is how Mr. Chesterton has taken his mushrooms and little Bethel. Of the many ways of cooking mushrooms, Richard Jeffreys goes on, the simplest is the best, that is, on a gridiron. Mr. Chesterton gives the impression that is precisely how he would prefer his mushrooms and little Bethel for Mr. Chesterton does not like mushrooms. The really extraordinary feature of the whole thing is that I like mushrooms all the better, for the very reason that leads Mr. Chesterton to pour upon them his most withering and pitiless contempt. He hates them because they spring up in the night. Little Bethel is a monstrous mushroom that grows in the moonshine. It is perfectly true that Little Bethel, like the mushrooms, flourished in the darkness. Like Mark Tapley, she was at her brightest when her surroundings were most dreary. In this respect, both the meeting-house and the mushrooms are in excellent company. Many fine things grow in the night. Indeed, Sir James Crichton Brown, the great doctor, in his lecture on sleep, argues that all things that grow at all grow in the night. Night is nature's growing time. Now Michael Fairless shared Richard Jeffrey's fondness for mushrooms. Every reader of The Roadmender will recall the night in the woods. Through the still night I heard the nightingales calling, 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 until I could bear it no longer, and went softly out into the luminous dark. The wood was manifold with sound. I heard my little brothers who moved by night rustling in grass and tree, and above and through it all the nightingales sang and sang and sang. The night wind bent the listening trees, and the stars yearned earthwards to hear the song of deathless love. Louder and louder the wonderful notes rose and fell in a passion of melody, and then sank to rest on that low, thrilling call which it is said death once heard and stayed his hand. At last there was silence. The grey dawn awoke and stole with trailing robes across earth's floor. Gathering a pile of mushrooms, children of the night, I hasten home. The nightingales, the singers of the night. The mushrooms, the children of the night. These singers of the night and these children of the night almost remind me of Faber. Angels of Jesus, angels of light, singing to welcome the pilgrims of the night. But Mr. Chesterton does not like the children of the night. Now, we must really learn better manners. It will not do to treat things contemptuously, either because they spring up suddenly or because they spring up in the night. In this matter, we Australians live in glass houses and must not throw stones. Mr. Chesterton is treading on our pet corns, for Australia and America are the two most monstrous mushrooms on the face of the earth. Like the nations of which the prophet wrote, they were born in a day. Think of what happened in America in the ten short years between 1830 and 1840. No nation in the history of the world can produce so astounding a record. In 1830, America had 23 miles of railway. In 1840, she had 800 in 1830, the country presented all the wilder characteristics of an early colonial settlement. In 1840, it was a great and populous nation. In 1830, Chicago was a frontier fort. In 1840, Chicago was a city. In 1830, the population of Michigan was 32,000. In 1840, it was 212,000. It was during this sensational decade, too, that the first steamships crossed the Atlantic and the spirit of the age reflected itself in the literary wealth of which America became possessed at that extraordinary time. Whittier and Longfellow, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Nathaniel Hawthorne, Emerson and Bancroft, Poe and Prescott, all arose during that eventful period, and made for themselves names that have become classical and immortal. Here is a monstrous mushroom for you. Or, to pass from the things of yesterday to the things of today, see how, under the shadow of the Rocky Mountains, Canadian cities are, in our own time, shooting up with positively incredible swiftness. No, no, Mr. Chesterton must not speak disparagingly of mushrooms.
and look at the rapidity at which these young nations beneath the southern cross sprang into existence i remember standing on the seashore in new zealand talking to a couple of old whalers who told me of the times they spent before the first emigrant ships arrived when they were the only white men for hundreds of miles around and now why in their own lifetime these men had seen a great nation spring into being here i say again are mushrooms for you but do mushrooms really spring up as suddenly as they appear to do dan crawford tells us that in central africa if a young missionary attempts to prove the existence of god the natives laugh and pointing to the wonders of nature around exclaim no rain no mushrooms in effect they mean to say without some adequate cause if there were no god whence came the forest and the fauna now that african proverb is very suggestive no rain no mushrooms the mushroom that is to say has its roots away back in old rainstorms in fallen forests and in ancient climatic experiences too subtle to trace i have been reading dr cook's textbook and he and mr cuthill have convinced me that it takes about a million years to grow a mushroom the conditions out of which the fungus suddenly springs are as old as the world itself and the same consideration saves america and australia from contempt for both america and australia these mushroom nations are very very old dr stanley hall the president of the clark university was speaking on this aspect of things the other day in a very pregnant psychological sense he said ours is an unhistoric land our very constitution had a minerva birth that is a classical way of saying that it had a mushroom birth our literature customs fashions institutions and legislation were inherited or copied and our religion was not a gradual indigenous growth but both its spirit and its forms were imported ready-made from holland rome england and palestine no country is so precociously old for its years it follows therefore that australia is as old as the empire and the empire has its roots away back where the first man delved we must not allow ourselves to be duped by the trickery of appearances. These new things are very ancient. How long did it take you to paint that picture? Somebody asked Sir Joshua Reynolds. All my life, he replied. Anybody can grow fine flowers in the daytime, but what can you grow in the dark? That is the challenge of the mushrooms. What can you grow in the dark? The nights are the test, as Charlotte Bronte used to say when things were black as black could be poor charlotte wrote the days pass in a slow dark march the nights are the test the sudden wakings from restless sleep the revived knowledge that one sister lies in her grave and another not at my side but in a separate and sick bed the nights are the test they are indeed tell me can you grow faith and restfulness and patience and a quiet heart in the darkness if so you will never speak contemptuously of mushrooms again why dear me some of the very finest things in this world of ours spring up suddenly like the mushroom and spring up in the dark dean hall used to tell how he became a preacher for years he could not lift his eyes from his manuscript then one sunday evening the light suddenly failed his manuscript was useless and he found himself speaking heart to heart to his people the eloquence for which he was afterwards famed appeared in a moment and appeared in the dark and i am very fond of that story of the old american soldier he was stone blind but very happy and always wore his medal on his breast what do you do in these days of darkness somebody asked him do he replied almost scornfully why i thank god that for fifty years i had the gift of sight i saw abraham lincoln and heard the bugles call for the victory of truth and righteousness i go back to those scenes now and realize them anew I have lost my sight, but memory has been born again in the dark. If, therefore, we allow mushrooms to be treated with contempt, simply because they spring up suddenly and spring up in the night, we shall soon find other beautiful things, much more precious, brought under the same cruel condemnation. And what of a sudden conversion? Think of down in Water Street, and broken earthenware, and varieties of religious experience. What of that tremendous happening on the road to Damascus? The Philippian jailer, too. See him with a grim smile of satisfaction, locking the apostles in their terrible dungeon. Yet, before the night is through, he is tenderly bathing their stripes and ministering to them with all the gentle graces of Christian courtesy and compassion. A monstrous mushroom that grew in the night, would you call it? At any rate, it did not die with the dawn. 
Minerva births these with a vengeance. As for me, I have nothing but reverence for the mushrooms. They are among the wonders of a very wondrous world. End of Part 3, Section 2